Good morning, everybody, and welcome to First Baptist Church Bellevue. We're so glad you're here, and we're so excited you're going to worship with us this morning. My name is Mike Green, and I have the distinct privilege to share with you a whole... Man, I got a whole stack of stuff. We got a lot going on. I hear Pastor Ridge giggling. That must mean... That's nervousness. <laughs> because if there's a lot going on, it means he's got a lot to do. Anyway, we're so excited you're here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, if you're watching on live stream, welcome to you. And we're so glad you're here and so glad you're joining us. Uh, click that uh, subscribe button, hit that little bell, uh, ring the bell if you will, and that'll give you notifications and uh, let you know whenever we're up and new stuff is available. But those of you that are here, we're so glad you're here as well. Let me share with you a couple of things. But Hi, Miss Corey. We're glad you're up there this morning. Would you give me the uh, First Corinthians verse, and we'll read that together as we continue to walk through rebuilding, uh, as Pastor Stan's been hanging out in Nehemiah and reminding us all how important it is for us to gather together and be part of rebuilding of our church. Let's be always there. And read with me, if you will, First Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Great job. You guys are getting better every week. You might have this memorized by January when we'll come up with a new verse. All right, a couple of great, great, exciting things. Did you guys enjoy last week's BCA coverage? That was fantastic. Let them know. I see, I see some of the teachers here this morning even. So let them know how much, you know, it's so exciting to know that we are the light of the world beginning right here in Bellevue and radiating out. So let me share with you a couple of things. Let's start with the cake auction. This is a ladies' ministry. However, it's the men's annual cake auction. And a couple of things have changed. So if you read there, first of all, it's at 6 p.m. It used to be at 7.30. A lot of you were a little sleepy by then. So we're expecting, having moved it up to 6, that you'll be more energetic, enthusiastic, and maybe run out of money a little less soon. So that said, guys, uh, cake's got to be here by 5.30 in the fellowship hall. And uh, remember to bring the recipe that you used and, and put it with the cake so that we can give that out. And most importantly, some changes in the money. Um, this year, it's going to three separate scholarships, and they are three distinctly different things. Betty and Damon Walker scholarships are two. There's the Betty, Wa uh, Damon, Betty Walker scholarship, the Damon Walker scholarship, and then a brand new one in honor of Mike and Karen Dunn. They go to three distinctly different things. The Betty Walker scholarship is exclusively for uh, the younger ones at BCA. The Damon Walker Scholarship is for all kinds of things, including uh, college or um, technical school. So those more align for adults. And then the Mike and Karen Dunn Scholarship is for BCA. So three distinctly different things, and the monies will be divided up between those items equally. So please come and support because it really helps a lot of folks. I know a lot of our uh, young adults have really benefited from the Damon Walker Scholarship, and I know lots of the, the young children in our community will, be, will and have benefited from the two uh, Walker Scholarships. So I wanted to share those with you. Now, something really, uh, really important. The Women's Ministry is putting on a Missions Ladies Tea. I'm not sure. Do you have a slide for that, Corey? No? Okay. Well, we'll go out. You got a handout as you came in. So look at your handout. And let me fill in some information. It's September 18th at 10 a.m. till noon in the Fellowship Hall, $5 each. But what's so important about this is it's part of our missions fest. So be excited. It's all about missions. There will be a missionary speaker there, a missions speaker, however you prefer to hear that, uh, that will be present. And it will be a really exciting time to hear what God is doing around the world. So please plan on attending that. That entire weekend is dedicated to missions, and we're very excited about all that's happening. Now back up a week to the 12th. Anybody know what's happened on, on September 12th? Good, you don't know. All right, so n late breaking news, ready? It is Roundup, so be excited about Roundup. We'll have a, a lot of fun and excitement. My wife says the kids, which are growing, they have a lot of children upstairs, and that is a great testament to our missions work here, uh, right here in Bellevue and beyond. But 
they are so excited and driving her crazy about, we're going to make sure we have a water slide. So we absolutely will have a water slide on September 12th. We'll have a bunch of other stuff, but plan and come, uh, plan on enjoying a great meal. Now, Corey, throw that slide up there that you made. All right. This is a Corey slide and it says nursery duties. Now, if you can't figure what that is, I'm going to give you the G rated version. They have over a dozen kids in the, the children's area right now downstairs, separated from the dozen that are upstairs in the preschool area downstairs. They need some help taking care of all those kids. So thank you parents for bringing them, but that gives you an opportunity to serve with your church as well. So see Karina and uh, we'll get you set up. There is a background check anytime you're working with children here on campus, so be aware of that. But uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about that. I just want you to say, be excited that the children's department is growing and lots of people are showing up with their kids and trusting them to learn more and more about the Lord. So thank you for that and be excited. Okay, Wednesday night, 6.30, we have... Uh, where's it at? There's my slide coming. John? <laughs> John is teaching on Wednesday night, 6.30 in the NX, and we are working through the book of James at this point, so plan on coming to that. As always, on 6.30 on Wednesday nights, Pastor Richard and the choir is up here, and they would love to see you there and help lead us in worship. So if there's no other things to, to uh, discuss with you this morning or to share... Uh, just get up and let's give that big First Baptist wave and let's do it with enthusiasm. We're doing so much in the community. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome the First Baptist. Welcome to our worship service. And now let's welcome Pastor Stan as he gives us some updates. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, folks. You may be seated. A um, couple of things. First of all, uh, I seek forgiveness for an rather major error last week. Uh, we prayed over our BCA teachers, but not our public school teachers, and I feel a little bad about that. So I'm asking you, if you're a teacher in the public schools, would you mind standing that we can acknowledge you and let you know of our support? Todd Saputo is up in the balcony, and we... Thank you. Thank you for your service. All right, let me talk about a, a, a couple of other things. Uh, um, we have a, uh, a couple in our church that do not like publicity, but I, I feel compelled uh, to mention them. Brett and J.J. Howard uh, are simply amazing. Whenever I go, as Norm and I went to the marshal's house to talk about and prepare for the funeral that was held yesterday, and we say, do you need food? The answer is no, we don't. JJ has come by, and I know exactly what that means. They had enough food to feed their family. JJ uh, works behind the scenes, gets food ready. Brett spent many long hours, Friday and all of yesterday almost, trying to get our live stream back up and running after a lightning strike. Would you let, Br and by the way, they are both in full-time missions ministry, so would you let them know we really appreciate them. <laughs> let me uh, mention two other things before I pray. One is the COVID variant confusion that is happening among us. And as I always say, turn your ears off from the constant clatter and make your own decision regarding protection. I do want to tell you the young man yesterday whose life we celebrated died of COVID. I do want to tell you we've had a number of people down with COVID, and I mentioned James Thompson, who's back home, and we thank God for that recovering. And so you must feel comfortable wearing a mask, even coming to church, or not wearing a mask if, that's, if you've been vaccinated, but I do want to urge you, be careful. Just be cautious. All right, having said that, um, 
there was one other thing I was going to mention, uh, the masks. Oh, I'll talk about that in a second, the giving. Tyke Van der Poel, after the next song, will come and pray for our giving. If uh, to our online uh, live stream, thank you again. If you go to WW First Baptist Church, FBC Bellevue.org, on the right hand side of our website is a button you can hit, and that button will take you through the process. If you're sending a check, as many have, it's to First Baptist Church, Bellevue 6107, Southeast Agnew Road, Bellevue, Florida 34420. And thank you for your constant support, and we praise God for you and the way that you have helped us get through this absolute. Uh, traumatic year and a half, two years. We've gone down to less than half our normal attendance. And uh, uh, Sunday school, at least life groups are picking up a little, but uh, you have kept giving. And for that, I thank you. So after the next song, Tyke will come and pray. Now there are a few people I'd like you to think about as we pray. Obviously the Marshall family as we celebrate at Le Mans. I also want to thank Vivian, John LeHue, Brandon Hoffling uh, for being here yesterday and gi giving their time and also Brad, Brad East as we prepared for that, uh, uh, handle the funeral. Um, Nathan Dobbs, uh, Nathan, long time member of the church as well as the, her, uh, his parents, um, Ronnie and Moggy, and Nathan is still in hospital, recovering from a very serious auto accident and was very critically almost um, injured, and he's slowly recovering. Pray for the Dobbs family. James Thompson, I mentioned, recovering from COVID. James is an active, strong man, and he is wiped out. He's survived, thank the Lord. He's back home. And then we had word this morning, and I... HIPAA laws uh, pre uh, prevent me, and I've, been, I've actually been a little loose with that, not mentioning the reason. It's a non-COVID reason, but Darren Hill, a teacher at uh, BCA, was taken to hospital last night. So please keep him and BCA in your prayers. Many others of you that have gone through tough times, remember this. God is still on the throne. It's good to see Phil Toothman back in church after his hospitalization. Let us pray. Father, we simply turn to you and say, we, we are almost helpless against things that happen around us, to us, and our, yet our, as Jehoshaphat said, our eyes are upon you. Lord, we're not sure we cannot understand the way you work. All we can do is trust you. And so we pray this morning. We pray for the families involved, for the Marshall family, for the Dobbs family, for Nathan, for Darren Hill, James Thompson, and we pray for others who at this time especially need a touch of your hand in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is good to see you here in the house of the Lord. I want to invite you to stand with us as we sing a song of prayer and praise. Lord, reign in me. sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign Over every thought, over every word, may my 
my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In your darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign Just come forward, please. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we could come to honor you and worship you by our tithes and our offerings. Father, I pray that we use these tithes and offerings to further your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
heart's always hunger for Oh, our heart's always hunger Life can bring us storms. Those moments where we wander, wonder, doubt. The journey doesn't stop, but the progress does. It can be lonely, painful. Sometimes we try to stare it down, as if we could somehow will it to go away or we think we can go toe-to-toe and come out the other side, unscathed. We often forget just how small we are. The truth is, storms are inevitable. But when they appear, we have a protector, a savior who knows a thing or two about calming storms. A God who is a stronghold in times of trouble. In our weakness, He is strong. In our fear, He is courage. In our desperation, He is peace. Yes, storms are inevitable. But our God is invincible. Amen. In our life group classes, we're in the book of Revelation, and it is revealed to us there that God proclaims, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, and yet he loves us so much that he asks to come into our hearts and be our Lord and Savior. So I want to invite you to join us this morning as we worship. Let's stand together and sing, How Great Is Our God.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, Marge. Thank you, praise team. When I first started to go to church, I'd never had a background in church. I had never been to a Sunday school, Bible study, any of that. I married someone who was a dedicated follower of Christ, and through her witness, her teaching, and her influence, she eventually made me look for the same Christ as she followed. However, we would go to church occasionally. I'd, I'd kind of go under duress, but I nevertheless would go. And one of the things I discovered is that much as I enjoyed, uh, I got to know the preachers who were there, they eventually ordained me into the ministry many years later, but one of the things that I lamented and complained about to Norma as we headed out the back door while I was reaching for my cigarettes was that, why do you listen to that stuff? It is pointless. It has no practical meaning. 
Yes, I love to hear about the Red Sea party. That makes a great story. And oh, yes, I love to hear about the loaves being made in the feeding thousands. That's all good stuff. But it doesn't mean a thing in my life. That was my constant complaint. I've tried over the years to correct that as a, as a preacher and be very practical. My years as an army chaplain, and I've had, I must say, uh, delightful emails from soldiers uh, to talk a little about that. And uh, I, I still regret over the years that I was not so emphatic in showing this You've just seen it in a, in, in a video. You've heard it in song. God is in every aspect of our lives. We may not see it. We may not sense it. But he is there. And sometimes when I spoke either to children or to soldiers, and they'd kind of look, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say, all right, let me ask you a question. Right now, if you turned on the radio, would you hear the radio? Would you hear music? Well, what are you talking about? Well, it's around you. It's all here. You just don't have a receptacle to get the invisible waves of sound and to make it discernible to your ears. And that's so often what is happening. God is around us constantly. He's in our lives constantly. And we do not, we do not realize it. Now, two things this morning. I want to deal with Nehemiah chapter six, nine verses. And I want, to add, I want you to search yourself this morning. First of all, I search myself and find that I am... Uh, guilty in many instances. And I want to talk about the schizophrenic behavior of Christians. And I'll explain. And as I read these nine verses, here's the question. Are you with Sunbalat and Tobiah in your behavior here? Or are you with Nehemiah in your behavior here? Let's look at the actuality and practicality. So my, my message is entitled, When Your Motives Are Misunderstood. When Your Motives Are Misunderstood. Or we could be misunderstanding someone else. You apply it as you hear it. Let me just uh, give you this silly little poem. Have you heard of the terrible family called they? And the dreadful men venomous things they say? Why, half the gossip under the sun, if you trace it back, you will find begun in that wretched house of the they's. So often, they say pre preludes gossip, just the way, way we are. And so I want to talk about the fact, yes, and we could genuinely misunderstood, misunderstand somebody else's words. Oh, absolutely, it happens all the time. In fact, there's a lovely story of a father who's heading off to work and his college-educated son is there. And he says to the son, why don't you make yourself uh, you know, available to do something around the house? And the son says to the father, well, you know, I'm, I'm a highly educated student. I go to one of the best schools. Uh, you know, I don't need to be doing practical things with my hands. I'm much too clever for that. He says, well, son, I'll tell you what. I'll pay you money if you paint the house. Uh, okay. There are the paints, etc. Well, college kid agrees, going to make some money. And so the father goes off to work. He comes back. And he watches. There's his kid in the hot sun, painting away. But he notices his kid has got a lot bulkier. So he walks up to the boy and he says, what are you doing, son? And he looks, he says, is that a, a coat you're wearing? He said, yes. He says, that's another coat underneath the coat. Why are you wearing that? He said, well, dad, I read the instructions that said to be effective, you must put on two coats. <laughs> so often we can misunderstand in a way 
that takes what was said and completely changes it. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter six. Now it happened, now just, just sorry, let me just build up to that. Understand, Nehemiah's arrived, he's had his arguments, his discussions, he's yelled at people, get on that door, get on that door, build that wall. Where's the rest? Bring it up, bring up the bricks. Where's the ladders? Bring them up. So Nehemiah's in this hasty, take charge place. A little bit like Mike Green when they're putting up the tree. You'll get that sort of same thing. And Nehemiah says, now it happened when Sambalat Tobiah and Geshem the Arab, third person they've pulled into their little clique, and the rest of our enemies heard I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, although at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates. That Sambalat and Geshem uh, sent me a, a note sent to me saying, come let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messages to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease when I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sambalat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, in it was written, it is reported, they say, among the nations, Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding war that you may be their king. And you've also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king, so come therefore and let us consult together. Then I sent to him a saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in the, your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. When God's people begin to truly do God's work, you come under practical attack. And I want, to, I want to urge you to understand that so often we look at the horizontal and say, well, that's, God's not in that. God's only in the vertical. He's everywhere. He is horizontal, the alpha, the omega, the author, and the finisher of all things. So let's talk about what happens. Number one, people purposely twist your words and actions, purposely twist your words and actions. And I want you to think about this in the context of whether it's a church, whether it's a family, whether it's a business, wherever it is, the moment you try to live the life God has called you to live, there comes absolute chaos around you. They purposely twist your words and actions because they have a motive that disparages you. They have a motive that disparages you. <coughs> Sanballat, Tobiah, now Geshem, they did not want Jerusalem to look strong. They did not want Nehemiah to coordinate the people. They did not want to see it become a force for God. They did not want it. I want you to imagine you're selling your house and you really want that house to go for a higher price, but your neighbor doesn't want you to do anything. He wants to buy your house for next to nothing. So you get a beautiful fence built and the neighbor does nothing but disparage. Why? Because his motive is to buy your house, not to see it looking good. And that's really what we're talking about here. Proverbs 16, 28, a dishonest man spreads a strife and a whisperer separates close friends. So now you've got to decide. Now as I'm talking about what has happened in this chapter between these people, you've got to decide, uh, yeah, do I do that or am I like this or does it happen to me or do I happen to others? They have a motive that disparages you. 
They have a fear that disrespects you because you're a threat. And often in your Christian witness, especially out there in the world, you're a threat. Why do you think people despise the Bible? If you watch <coughs> anything on, uh, occasionally I get it on Facebook, of a, 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 uh, some people who go to these rallies to talk about Jesus, and people, the invective is vicious. They are vicious. Why? Because of one word, sinner. You call them a sinner and they want to go crazy. They don't want you. They don't want you to bring fear in their heart. Am I truly a sinner and will God reject me? So they become angry. You are a threat to them. No matter how good hearted you are. I like some of these little videos of people who rescue kittens. We have a psychologically disturbed cat and I'm, I'm always interested in other cats. And there was this one little kitten they found crunched in a little box there. And they wanted to feed it. And the man said to the woman, be careful. She said, ah, oh, it's just a kitten. And she put her hand and said, yeah, kitty, 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 kitty. And she came out bleeding from this kitten. Now, why would it do that? Why would it do that? Because it felt threatened. You wanted to feed it, you wanted to do it good, you wanted to love it, but it did not know that it felt threatened. And so often when we as Christians become judgmental and, and condemnatory people feel threatened. They don't understand what your motive is when your motive is, hey, I want you to be saved. I want you to have eternal life and I want you to walk with God and have the privilege and pleasure of a savior in Jesus Christ and a friend in the Holy Spirit. They have a fear that disrespects you. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. It happens all the time. It happens all the time, but do we make it happen? So we've got to question ourselves. They have a view that disdains you, that disdains you. You are mixing with their ideology, either their ideology or they are racist or territorialist. You're, 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 your, your view is coming into a place where they disdain you because they have a, a different view. And sometimes we are guilty of doing it without realizing it. I've told you the story. The president of the Bible seminary, which I attended many, many years ago, after the years I'd left, he and I became very close friends. But at the time, I hardly knew the man. And I'd gone to seminary, and therefore, like anybody who goes to college or university or place of learning and study, I knew everything. There was nothing I didn't know. And I knew it better than anybody, and I said it better than anybody, so how could anybody else think they did it better? The president of that seminary was one of the greatest preachers you would ever hear, and I was jealous. And so one day I was visiting somebody who I did not know was a close friend of his, and they said, how's, how's it going teaching under, under Rex? And I said, well, and I disdained him, put him down. And they went and told Rex. When I went back after the summer, I went back to seminary, he walked past me and said, I heard what you said. And eventually we got together and he said this to me. And it still applies sometimes. I'm still guilty of this and every time I am, I wanna slap myself before God leans out of heaven and slaps my head. Sometimes he said this to me, sometimes you pull people down in order to elevate yourself. You pull people down in order to elevate yourself. Well, it's not such a good, I could hit that ball out the park. <laughs> That's no big deal. Oh, I could kick that 67-yard field goal. 
I could, I just haven't had the chance. We do that. Sometimes it's harmless, other times it's harmful. Exodus 23.1. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Geshem the Arab said, no, I don't want that to happen. Hey, where am I? Let me tell you, dissenters always find other dissenters. Negative people always find other negative people. Birds of a feather flock together. That's the truth. It happens in organizations, in families, and in churches. And I can tell you over the 40 years, boy, have I seen that in spades. Winston Churchill exemplified integrity and respect in the face of opposition. During his last year in office, he attended an official ceremony and a few rows behind him, two gentlemen were speaking. One said, that's Winston Churchill. They say he's getting senile. They say he should step aside and leave the running of the nation to a more dynamic and capable man. When the ceremony was over, Churchill turned to the men and said, oh, by the way, gentlemen, they also say he's deaf. (laughs) Second point is people persist in painting a wrong picture. They persist. We have, it's havoc at the moment in the public arena. Depends who you want to watch. You pick the commentator you want to watch and you'll get the story he wants you to have. Left, right, you name it. It is sickening that the honesty, the honesty has given way to dishonesty. It's just the way it is. Agenda has become the victim of ideology. In Africa, they have a saying, when the elephant fight, it's the grass that gets hurt the most. That's what happens. So people persist in painting a wrong picture. There's a little ad that comes on TV, or I've seen it, and I love it. Uh, or maybe it's on Facebook. I'm not sure where I saw it. A mother is looking at the camera saying, uh, with the children, saying, children, your father doesn't want me anymore. He's leaving me. And a voice in the back said, that's not what I said. I said I wasn't taking you out to dinner tonight. She said, it's the same thing. (laughs) So sometimes what you've said can be painted in an entirely different picture. They misrepresent your position because it suits their narrative. Proverbs 20, 19. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. And there is definitely a challenge to us as we follow Christ to be careful with whom we associate. Be careful with whom we associate because eventually you can become a Geshem dragged into their little group. They mischaracterize your personality. They mischaracterize your personality. It is, it is hurtful sometimes True story, a guy invited me to lunch. He had just come to the, hadn't been to the church long. Would I go out to lunch? I have never turned down a free meal. So we went to lunch and I said, well, tell me a bit about yourself. He told me, he he said, by the way, you're not nearly as arrogant as they say you are. (laughs) Now you can imagine how I enjoyed the lunch. (laughs) Really had a good time. Now, of course, I've grown older and a little more grumpy and a little less uh, polite. I'd say, did you say that to make me feel good? Is that what you were doing? Or were you putting me down? Do you know people put each other down all the time? Remarks that you think are jocular, they're putting you down. And we do that. I do that. We all do that. Something we've got to watch. We've got to say, hold on a second. Hold on, am I mischaracterizing their personality? James 4.11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. How many of those people have we not encountered over the years? However, 
there's good news. God is in this. God is in this. And when you examine it, you know what he said, what Nehemiah said, just uh, crucial words. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. He didn't say, kill them. He didn't say, grab them and throw them away from me. He just said, strengthen me to continue the work. Psalm 101, verse five, they misunderstand God's protection is the third point. They misunderstand God's protection. Psalm 101, verse five, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. God makes the threat. In another passage of the Bible, he says, vengeance is mine. And so we've got to trust God that he's at work in all of this. He's at work. We just don't see him at work. But you know, gossip is a, a terribly cruel thing. I've had it over the years. You've had it. You've had it in your family. You've had it wherever you are. And it hurts sometimes. It hurts. And the people who do it sometimes do it in fluent Christianese. I've learned that. They don't gossip. They say, you know, the Lord has just led me to say this. Or, you know, I love that brother. I, I do. I just wish he'd be a little more aware of biblical responsibility. That's how they do it. It's the spreading of gospel in a manner that seems as though you really don't want to do this. Story about a man who went to his local rabbi. And he said, Rabbi, I heard what you had to say, and I confess, I do it. And, rabbi, and the rabbi says, I know, my, my son, uh, you've done it about me a lot. And the man said, yes, I have, you're right. What can I do to fix it? The rabbi said, I want you to go and get a pillow. Now, in those days of the story, a pillow was one we bought, was filled with feathers. You, I don't know, any of you age yourself that you had a pillow of feathers? So I want to take that pillow of feathers, I want you to go to the town square, take out a knife, slit it open, shake it. Man did that, and he came back to the rabbi. He said, I've done that. And the rabbi said, now here's what I want you to do. Go back and collect the feathers. And the man said, it's impossible. And the rabbi says, as it is with your words. So you see, folks, whether you are a, a part of the gossip or uh, you are part of the gossip or you are a victim of gossip, the damage is done by words. However, God promises he will protect you. God promises he will protect you. And Nehemiah in the next portion of that chapter spends his time talking to God and saying, what shall I do? And then he understands that God is truly listening. God realises it's painful for you. When people say these things about you and hurt you and family hurt you, your children hurt you and uh, whoever it is, God knows how painful that is. There is nothing, by the way, more painful than when family hurt you with their words. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You know, there's an interesting uh, phrase in the Greek uh, under Romans 12, where it says, this is your reasonable service. The actual phrase is, is in such a way that if we were to colloquially modernize it, saying, what else do you expect? What else do you expect? This is what you do. This is what you do. So he realizes it's painful for you to have, to have things said that, that truly hurt. He recognizes there is little you can do. The feathers cannot be collected. There's little you can do. 
I served as, in the chaplain corps as the aide-de-camp to the chaplain general, Norman Wood. You've met him. He came here with his wife. They were missionaries in Japan. Real character, he wore that robe and just a, just a wonderful, wonderful man. And Norman was the man of the hour. He was the man of the hour in our country that was at war. People were dying. Norman would do the funeral of the generals. He would do the funeral. In fact, a former prime minister died and Norman did the funeral all on TV. Norman was a tall, everything that one would get jealous about if you were in his company. Tall, good-looking, and flamboyant. And I resented that. But I was simply his aide. But I loved the man. He had such a wonderful, wonderful air about him. Yet everybody tore him to pieces. Egotistic, narcissistic, always likes the limelight, never met a camera he didn't like. And I'd laugh a little at that, but I'd say to Norman, why do you let them say these things? And he'd look at me and he'd say, there's nothing we can do. God knows what they've said. And I was too really young in the faith to fully understand it. Proverbs 35, 6, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and found you to be a liar. In other words, if you truly believe that God is both sovereign, your Lord and your protector, don't doubt him. Don't doubt him. Just give it to him. And sometimes, by the way, the hurt that you are feeling, you may just have to get alone with God and say, okay, let me give this to you. Let me see if I can get it off my shoulders and give it to you. Because that's what he said. Come unto me, all ye that are heavily burdened and laden, and I will give you peace. Finally, he reorganizes circumstances to encourage you. That's where he's at work. He reorganizes circumstances. In the army, I had a fellow officer who absolutely, in my opinion, despised me. He did everything he could to put me down. I knew it, I just didn't, what could I do? Challenge him to a sword fight? I thought about that. Uh, uh, what could you do? What could you do? You just, you just had to, when people told me, I just had to accept, made me angry. I was still a young, strong man, but not strong in the faith. And I want to go. One day I got a phone call, probably uh, 15 years, 14, 15 years later. And it was his voice. And I said, hello. He said, do you know who this is speaking? And he named his name. He said, I just want you to forgive me for the things I said and did. God brought me under conviction. And I just said, yay, God. Yay, God. Lord, can I give you a list? There are a few more I'd like you to zap. That's what God does. God will protect you and take care of you. He reorganizes. Listen, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may endure it. He's in the details. He's in the little things. He's in that part of your life, that person you work with that gives you problems. He's in every aspect of our lives. The problem is we don't recognize it and realize it. In the early days of America, the American Indians, or what we refer to as Native Americans, had a custom in more than one tribe. When a young man turned 13, he was then expected to be able to hunt, fish, eat, eat from his own hands. But to, to symbolize it, they sent him into the woods overnight, 13 years of age, by himself. And naturally, 
It was terrifying. And the story is the young man would go into the woods and he would, he would sort of cringe and creep and all the sounds, the coyote, the wolf, the unusual sounds that were around him would terrify him. Absolutely. And shivering, he would stay in position, begging the sun to shine. And when dawn came and the light came through the trees, he was aware of a figure not more than six to eight feet from where he was. And when the light became brighter, he recognized his father. Who while the father let the son believe he was in great peril, was there with the sword ready to protect. That's who our God is. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. That's what we sang earlier. That's who he is. That's why he's in every facet, every detail of our lives. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray for anyone here this morning that is going through a tough time a time where they feel almost victimized. And I pray that you will bless them and touch them and that you will encourage them. And even if this particular subject that we've talked about now is not their problem, you will remind them that you are sovereign, you are their Lord, and you will never, ever leave them alone. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as we sing just one or two verses of hymn of invitation, would you consider this? Have you received Jesus Christ as your saviour? Can you honestly say, well, having heard the Bible, I can apply it because I, I believe that I have access to God. The only way you can have access to God is in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's why when you, we say, have you received Christ as your saviour, what we're saying is, have you received the receptacle, the radio, where you can turn it on and hear the voices that are aimed at you? Have you asked Christ to come and connect you and put his hand on yours and the other on God? Number one. Number two, are you confident of your salvation? And you can only be confident when you say, Lord Jesus, I confess I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and to be my child. That's, that's the way you connect and begin a journey. If you are on that journey and the one thing you have omitted uh, to, to rejoice in is in that God is close by watching over you, sometimes that's called rededication, that you rededicate your life to God and say, forgive me for walking away. I now understand that you love me, you care for me and I'm in your hands. Father, if there's one that needs to come that we might pray together before the service is closed, let them come in Jesus' name, amen. Lord Jesus, I long to be You need to come and pray. Just don't wait, don't hesitate. Don't wait to see who else comes. close. I see the Marshall family up there. I didn't see you up there earlier. Our hearts are with you. It was a joy to be at the service yesterday and to hear the wonderful tributes and to realize and recognize what a family you are that walk so closely with God. May he truly comfort you, take his gr your grief and let you find joy in the promises that he has given you. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, give you a peace that passes all, all understanding and make you excited about the fact that he cares about you personally, he knows your name, he knows your circumstances, and he is your protector. Amen. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So once you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. Amen. God bless you as you go. Have a great week serving our wonderful Lord.